Benvenuti. Uh, hello, good morning, welcome here. Uh, non c'è uh, traduzione simultanea, there will be no uh, translation here. So, the, basically, the workshop will be uh, in English, uh, non c'è traduzione, quindi uh, fondamentalmente il workshop sarà tenuto in inglese. Uh, io tuttavia sono uh, presente e quindi posso aiutare nel facilitare in certi momenti, specialmente nell'interazione, nel momento in cui qualcuno del pubblico voglia prendere la parola in italiano, io potrò tradurre in inglese. So, but I, I'll be here anyway so I can help with uh, uh, facilitating communication from Italian into English for the interactive part of the uh, workshop. Uh, and welcome, this is the second, uh, the second workshop of, organized by the Online News Association, uh, the uh, organization that partners with the festival since 2009. Questo è il, uh, è il secondo workshop di una uh, serie organizzata dall'Online News Association che è partner del festival dal, 2000, eh, eh, dal 2009. Uh, mh, il workshop in questione, uh, spero lo sappiate ma lo ripetiamo, riguarda, eh, parleremo degli eh, strumenti, i modi, modi e gli atteggiamenti necessari per usare i social media come strumento di verifica delle informazioni da parte del cronista. The workshop will be about uh, tools and actually the uh, right approach to uh, use social media's uh, verification tools in your uh, reporting. Uh, ci aiuterà in questo Fergus Bell, eh, che uh, è Head of Newsroom Partnership and Innovation at Samdesk, oltre che co-leader del gruppo di discussione sull'utilizzazione eh, etica e deontologicamente sana del user generated content dell'Online News Association. Uh, Fergus is head of newsroom and partnership innovation at Samdesk and is also co-leader of the ONA UGC Ethics uh, Discussion Group. And uh, uh, so, uh, welcome everybody and uh, hopefully will be a nice hour. Fergus. Hi everyone. Uh, to, because this is a workshop, I'm going to make it uh, quite interactive. So hopefully there's a microphone that we that can go around the room. I'm going to ask some questions, and I'd really like your input or thoughts as I as I come to those parts. May, may I add to this that uh, if, if and when you uh, want to say something, please wait until... Uh, 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 our friend here will lend you the mic because we, uh, the, we are streaming live this session. So, of course, if you don't speak into a mic, people won't hear you. Uh, quindi, per piacere, aspettate per parlare in microfono perché siamo live con lo stream. Grazie. So, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, social media verification and everything that I talk about here is uh, completely scalable to, to any newsroom. So, whether you're a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond, um, it's completely relevant to you and you can tailor it in the way that suits you. It's a lot about setting up your processes and your approach to it beforehand, um, uh, as well as kind of understanding the tools that you need before you need them. So the most important tools that you need are your own um, senses really, your own eyes and ears and your own head to, to think about the, the the way that people are sharing social content, that is a huge uh, part of the way that we verify it. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about user-generated content. Uh, I used to work for the Associated Press, and this was the, this was the uh, terminology that we used. Uh, the term commonly used in the news industry for content with news or editorial value that has been produced by non-journalists. So there's often a confusion when we're talking about social media or social content for reporting that uh, this, the content that comes from accidental journalists or uh, citizen journalists, uh, that can be confused with the other stuff that is shared online. So when I'm talking about user-generated content uh, throughout this hour, I'm talking about this definition. I'm not talking about anything that's on YouTube. So the verification is, comes down to uh, a couple of things, uh, process and tools. And I would say that process is, is the most important part of it um, and can essentially be your most important tool. And I would advise anyone who is uh, coming up with their own verification process to really sit down with your newsroom and work out exactly how that's going to, uh, how that's going to work for you and your organization based on the resources that you have available, 
uh, based on what you're able to do during breaking news and have that that in your mind before before you ever need it. I'm just going to keep saying that over and over again because it's it's so important. It's never a good idea to come up with, with your policy during a breaking news situation. <laughs> so uh, this is this is my verification process that I'm going to talk you through, um, and it's a two stage process. So uh, I think that it's best to verify the source and then verify the content separately. What that means is that you're not taking someone's word for it. You're looking, at the, you're looking at the content that they're sharing, but you're not allowing them to tell you everything about that content and define the story based on that one source. In any other aspect of journalism, we don't rely on one source, um, and so we shouldn't when it comes to social content um, and, and digital news gathering. So verification of the source. This is the first, the first part of that would be uh, reviewing their social history. So everyone in this room who has ever posted to, social, uh, to a social media platform has started to build up a social history. I know uh, what, what kind of subject you're posting about. Sometimes I might know where you're posting from. That can be incredibly important when verifying content itself. If you see a video of a tornado, uh, you need to look at that person's social history to see if they've ever posted from that location before or if they're just a kid who loves posting tornado videos from their bedroom in Florida. So you need to, you need to work out, uh, could that person have been in that, right pl there, in that place at the right time? It's essential for verification to make contact with the individual. Again, when we're using other, in, in other ways of reporting, we don't just go from, we don't just take someone's word for it. If we, we like to interact with them. We need to ask them questions. We need to ask them uh, for permission as well. Um, all of that helps with the verification. And whether, you, whether your uh, news organization has taken the stance that you need to ask for permission before you run something, actually, if you ask for someone's permission, it's a very clear way of um, working out if they are the genuine owners of that content and if it is genuine. If someone is reluctant, that can be a, a, a big indicator that something isn't right um, and it builds up part of the case for, for the verification of that, of that content. So that's a very quick rundown of, of verifying the source. I will g dive into it a little bit deeper in a moment. Then we move to verifying the content. And as you can see, I've drawn a line down the, or you may not be able to see, but it's, there's a dotted line down the middle of, of the page there. This is because we need, to we need to keep these two parts completely separate and see if we can get to the same conclusions at, at the end of each process. If we can, then I think we can consider the content verified. If we can't, then it means that we're making a leap somewhere in, in the judgment on that, on that piece of content. So. Verifying the content, what do I mean by that? If you can, translate the text and audio. You might, if it's in your own language, you might not need to. If it's in another language, this is, this is really important because there can be different, uh, especially on YouTube videos, a caption, a caption can say one thing, but if you haven't translated the audio, then it might, mean, it might be saying something else, and you need to see if there's a discrepancy between the two of them. You need to consult independent experts or internal experts. And this, this can work for a huge organization or it can work for a small organization. Essentially what I'm saying here is ask the person who, you, who is most likely to be able to provide the most insight that you have access to. So whether that's a colleague who's been to that place or you can um, speak to someone on the phone who is, who is there and not the provider of this content, um, that is that is the best that you can do. You have to break out of the social media bubble in order to to verify it. and again go back to your old instincts for reporting Pick up the phone or just ask someone else So that's where I mean seek separate com confirmation uh, Can anyone confirm that this event happened or is it just? Uh, through this one source if it's multiple sources uh, on social are those sources connected do they have an agenda? Can you, uh, can you make a connection between them? If you can, you probably need to then uh, find a separate source for that. And then finally, establish context. I think all of this stuff is already living on social. Very little of it is, pri is, is private or on private accounts. Therefore, if you're establishing 
the, the context you're giving an audience something that they haven't got just by going to those social sites. You're, make, you're turning it into the story that it is and you're crafting it and you're, you're lending your expertise to that. And you're also showing everything that you've done in the verification process in order to be transparent about it. That is, um, establishing context I think is, is a very good kind of value proposition for us as well. This uh, is a video that, um, I'm just gonna pause it for a moment. So I've got two examples of how this verification process um, come, can, can be applied and has been applied in real life. So the video I'm about to show you is, is something that was shared by Ukrainian activists who claimed that uh, a helicopter had been shot down uh, in Ukraine. And now I can't remember if it was, yes, it was a Ukrainian, it was the activists saying that a Ukrainian helicopter had been shot down by uh, rebels. Uh, they shared this, and this is the video. Oh, no, that's not the video. There we go. It's a very distinctive uh, image of a helicopter falling out of the sky. Now, putting this through the verification process, uh, it, didn't, it didn't pass the verification process because there is nothing there that can indicate where it is. There is nothing there to indicate, there's no audio, there's no text. There, well, there was text, but only one source of text. And often with videos, uh, people are, there's, there is audio in the background, people are talking or giving some indication about what's going on. There was nothing in this, situ in this case. Um, and then putting it through the process, um, you know, verifying the content itself and seeking uh, expertise from that, that we had access to, this is, I'd seen it before. So, and I knew that I'd seen it before and I knew that it was a really distinctive uh, piece of video because how many times have you seen a helicopter tumbling out of the sky like that? Um, and I'd seen it in Syria. Where you can see, you can hear the audio, which clearly places it. and people, you, you know, the audio connected to a person, it doesn't seem very Ukrainian. And there's the same helicopter falling out of the sky. So it, it was incredibly compelling footage to, to run, you know, when it, when it came out the second time. But for those of us who had seen it the first time, we know that we'd already run it. And it, it's 100% the same, same footage and you can compare it against the power lines as it goes past. It is the same. Now, it didn't pass the verification test and as much pressure as there was to put something like that out, um, it just didn't pass it. On that process, you'd have to make a leap. Um, and that's why you don't make a leap. And that's why you have your verification process in place before you, before you need it. So I'm going to show you another video, which you're all probably aware of. Uh, again, uh, I'm going to show you this video. Uh, I knew that it was not right bef without even looking at the video itself because of the way that it was uploaded. The caption was in English, and this was um, the video I'm about to show you is from Syria. The video was in English. The, the caption was in English. There was no audio, there, uh, no audio narration on the video. Um, it had been uploaded in a way that was completely unlike any other Syrian activist video. Um, and it wasn't, we couldn't confirm it with any Syrian activist what the original source of it was. Um, and this is the video. It's the Syrian Hero Boy video, which... Allah Akbar, 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 Allah
No, my mistake. There, there is audio, but it's not uh, describing what is happening, and that is not typical of any other Syrian video that's been uploaded. Well, this is fake. Some people uh, said that they thought it was fake because of the way the boy falls. I can, from looking at three years of Syrian videos, uh, the real stuff looks just, you know, can look just like this or just as unbelievable. It, it, that is not an indication that it wasn't real. So that was made by uh, Norwegian documentary makers who were looking to try and insert some video into uh, the network in order to, to fool journalists. It didn't fool many journalists who have verification processes that stop that um, would have meant that it didn't pass. But again, it's it's amazingly compelling video, but it's not real. And the damage that we can do by putting this out there is is not worth it. So I have a scenario, and this is where we're going to get a little bit interactive. Um, this scenario is a fictional scenario. Um, there's one. Uh, illustration in there, which I'd rather you didn't take a photo of and tweet. It's fine for the live stream, it just looks, makes me look very insensitive if it's taken out of context. You'll see exactly what I mean when we come to it. Um, so this is a scenario to look at how we might uh, assess a breaking news situation and how we might go about verifying it and the things that we need to consider. Uh, I am going to throw a few ethical curveballs in there as well. Um, so. The scenario starts like this. There's a tweet, um, and I'm sorry that it's based in the US, but um, just, just the one that I did. So, uh, multiple gunshots heard at Stanford, uh, update soon. What does that, does anyone have an immediate thought about what that might mean and what, what action we might need to take? I'm gonna ask for uh, answers to be kind of quite brief because we've got, a, this is quite a, a detailed scenario. Someone does have an immediate thought, be brave. Okay, oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, being from the US, I happen to know that the station with a W in front of it is generally on the East Coast. I don't know that station in particular, so I would be a little bit curious why an East Coast station is talking about a West Coast event. Okay, that, that was unintentional, and <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh, that was um, my mistake. I should have realized it was a very tough audience. Um, that lo the logos that you see on the left are just illustrative of it being a news organization, um, and I tried to make, find a generic one, but um, obviously I didn't do such a good job. So um, Stanford is actually in, in, on the west, uh, in the west of the country, and most people would think that it's, uh, the, most people think of the university um, and might focus their attention straight away on that. What I'm trying to illustrate here is that actually you need a little bit more context. So a second tweet, shots fired in the Stanford City Mall, not university. Don't rush to conclusions. Don't start, uh, it would be very quick to put out something to say that actually it's something had happened at the university if that's the first thing that you think of especially if it's not some, somewhere that you're familiar with. Um, and there's a huge difference. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the impact that putting out wrong information might have as well, especially as we uh, are living in a, 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 you know, the, the barriers between kind of global and, and regional organizations are blurred because everyone can see everyone else's content and Twitter does not discriminate against that. So this is a map. Um, of Stanford Shopping Center, uh, and it's right next to the to the university. Um, that might mean then that. Well, what does it mean? Anyone got any thoughts about how we might start uh, thinking about finding something that we can verify or finding content in order to illustrate this? What does this map tell you? I guess you'd start using the phone and ringing the boutique wine bar, for example, or any of the, the, the restaurants or cafes nearby to see what they're hearing and what they're seeing. And, and in a kind of social context, 
where might we be, be focusing our search if we're kind of looking at the social verification? Well, you can quickly have a look at their social media accounts, for example. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's unlikely that the that they yes the 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 region the local businesses might start sharing content on their social media accounts. But it's right next to Stanford University, and there's a good chance that students who are probably big on social media w might start sharing as well. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that if you have, you have to get into the minds of the people that might be in that situation and start thinking about where you might look. Um, I use the analogy that if you're, if you know, if Justin Bieber does something at his concert, it's going to be captured on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Whereas if Engelbert Humperdinck does something at his conference, it's unlikely because of the people that are in that audience. They're not, they're less likely to be sharing on social. So instantly, I would look at the proximity to the university, realize that it's a shopping center where a lot of young people might be. And therefore, I would look at, I think it would be worth spending time looking on social. So there's a tweet, um, and it's a retweet. Jenny Piccolo, oh my God, someone is shooting in the mall. Where is Joni? Help. So from this, we can, and this has been retweeted by um, ABC 10 Eyewitness News, a generic station in the West. Um, what... Does anyone have any thoughts about what we might do with this information? Your journalists working in newsrooms, you, yeah. Wait, wait. Uh, so you'd want to contact Jenny Piccolo pretty quickly or work out who Jenny Piccolo is. I'm quite surprised they would have retweeted it already, but um, that's what you'd want to do, I guess. Yeah, so we want to know who Jenny Piccolo is, um, and the way to do that is to actually um, look for, well not look for the retweet, but look at her original page. So this is a second uh, retweet. Jenny Piccolo, we're hiding in Burberry dressing room. Joni C, are you still in the bathroom? Matt, any thoughts on that? Uh, so we're looking now, we found out who Joni is. So we know there's an account of four Joni, so we can, mm -hmm. from what you were saying, look at both accounts and find out a bit more about both of those people. Yep. Sounds like they're both live in the situation, so... Yep. If you're a broadcaster, you've got to think about safety of the individuals here as well and things like that. Yep. Does anyone else have any thoughts about what we can do with this? And remember, we're trying to, f to verify the information and find content. <laughs> we could use the names, especially Jenny Piccolo, and cross it with other social media sites. Let's go to Facebook and Instagram and see what she has posted there, maybe find if she is really in Stanford, if she is really in a mall. In a mall. And how would we find out if she's, she's really there if sh and she wasn't just posting from? From earlier posts. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, okay. Maybe she posted about being in a mall, going okay. to the mall yep. beforehand. Yep. So um, we'll come back to her in a moment. Uh, BNN, a Broadcast News Network, a generic <laughs> rolling news station. Um, shows uh, a video of people running through the mall. Gunshots are heard clearly. Um, there's an on-screen credit to um, for the video YouTube slash uh, viral video news. You d your news organization has had no visuals. What do you do? What do you do with this information? I told you it would be interactive. <laughs> uh, well, you could definitely look into viral video news and see what they've posted in the past. Um, you could try comparing the visuals of the mall to, pos you know, if you can find other like photos or video of inside the same mall. Though I imagine that could be difficult to verify it's the right mall because they all kind of look the same, right? Yeah. So the, the, the point that I'm trying to, to raise here is if you see some, something that's called viral video news, it's unlikely that they would be the kind of people that would be, po that would be capturing stuff live. It's more likely that they are resharing stuff. Um, so look at, so, and no one said we'll just take the video, which is good, um, because this does give some information about how to start tracking it back, but nothing that we could use. So... Um, 
Agency news alerts confirm that Stanford Mall is on lockdown because of a reported shooter on site. They're reporting multiple people injured. Outside, your f- reporters or photographers or video journalists are arriving at the mall. They're restricted at the police perimeter. We are, you're not going to get any visuals yourself. Your old school traditional reporting uh, on the ground is frozen. There's nothing you can get. You have no visuals. So this is the picture. I p- please don't uh, tweet out of context. So this is a, a photograph um, showing uh, by Jenny Piccolo, because you've been monitoring her as an original source. Um, and it's showing a gunman, um, and there are two uh, bodies on the floor. This is the first visual from inside the mall. What do you do with it? How can you use it? I'll wait, I'll wait you out. Someone, someone must, uh, <laughs> uh, no, Matt, okay, yeah. Um, so I don't think you can use it. Um, you'd, from the graphic you're showing, uh, you'd want to see the location, have a sense of, is that familiar to the, the mall or the building you know where the incident's happened? Um, but yeah, certainly using live watching, we wouldn't use anything like that. Yeah, so we can use this for contextual uh, work. We can t- we can look to see if it might actually be the interior of the mall, but it's uh, very unlikely that we could use something like this at this time. One, it might put the person who's taken the photo um, in extreme danger because they've clearly been got up close to the person who is committing crime um, and sharing that photo might indicate to the person who's committing the crime that there are people in there who can see him. And that, that is uh, something that we need to think about more and more. What is the impact of us showing content from a live situation or interacting with people in a live situation? If I may yeah. I mean, this is, uh, uh, so we, we are straddling two fields. One is verif- verification, the other one mm-hmm. are ethical choices, right? Yes, yes. Which come together. Which come together. So you might verify something quickly, but actually uh, it might j- you might just have to use content for verifying the, the facts on a story rather than verifying it to, to get it on air. On, and something like that in a live situation, that might be the case. So You've been, doing, you've been running a few YouTube searches, you refresh your search, and you see a new video appear. Paramedics are performing CPR on at least one person in, in the area behind the police cordon. Your people can't get there, they're behind a barrier. Again, it's a very frustrating situation, but there's nothing verifiable about that. This is where, I can tell you that in, in a newsroom where there is where you're this far into a news event, and verifying information is becoming so difficult, um, it can be really easy to, um, to decrease your standards when it comes to verification in order to get something out. And I'm trying to show you here that there is that pressure and knowing what your policy is beforehand is, is so important. So Richie Cunningham uh, just tweeted, my, my sis just called me from Stanford Mall, uh, heard bangs and phone went dead, just ringing now anyone know anything so what are your thoughts on what we can do with this yes at the back there Uh, I think this is a fake it's not fake it's not fake the the names are uh, it's not fake it's not a fake scenario so w- with this, we, we can't do anything in a live situation necessarily, but uh, we right now have a, a potential family member that we be can uh, verify at the time. This person is connected to the story at the time that it's happening, um, and if anything was to happen to this woman, um, it's likely that we now know who her brother is, and we can probably do a follow-up. So knowing this at the time before... Uh, before Twitter gets flooded with with names or um, other details, and it, it's useful to bank this information because um, because you'll need it later, and finding it later in the noise is incredibly difficult. They've u- also used a hashtag. 
So uh, BNN, the uh, completely fictional rolling news uh, station, um, is running the paramedic video. You still haven't heard anything back from the poster. What do you do? Is there any video? Can you run the video? No, you're shaking. I, l I led that question. There. Um, so you, you actually get a response from the person that you, that you messaged. Hi, the video isn't mine. I uploaded it from my friend Chachi. He said you can call him, and this is his number. This is, a, this is kind of what is, what is, why it is worth waiting and putting it through the proper verification process. Everyone else is running a video from, an un, from a, a source that's not original. Um, this guy uploaded it for a friend. We've got a phone number. We can talk to the person that is there and uploaded the video. We can get permission. That waiting time has allowed us to verify it properly and get something that no one else will have. And that's why it's worth um, putting it through a proper verification process. So you've got permission from uh, Chachi Gonzalez, uh, and you're good to go. You're now running content from the, from the scene. Reporters on the ground are reporting that four bodies are being, re are being removed from the mall and SWAT teams are entering. There's a tweet. It's from uh, Newsy Ralph, and he says that a second shooter is spotted in Stanford Mall. It's been re retweeted 45 times. Um, including by NPR's person on the ground. What would you do? What can you do with this information? How might we verify it? Okay, we might verify it by um, actually speaking to the police or uh, finding it out. Someone who's called Newsy Ralph. I tend to be wary of anyone using a Z, by the way, in a, in a username. Um, Newsy Ralph might not be someone who, who is completely trustworthy uh, and indeed. Uh, agency alerts confirm that police confirm only one active shooter in the mall, shooter holding ground at Macy's perfume counter. So you get an inside tip. San Francisco Stringer gets a preliminary name from the law enforcement sources before anyone else. Um, the name is Arthur Fonzarelli. You've got a name. How might, we, how might we use this name? And I'm not going to accept no answer from the room. So someone, how might we use this name? It's on. It's on. Okay, yeah, so you could start by doing uh, uh, background research. So, can you find a person called Arthur Fonzarelli on Facebook, on Twitter, on other social media sites who lives in the same area? Okay, so your ser your uh, a search using Google for Arthur Fonzarelli shows that there are two people of that name in the area. Um, both have public Facebook profiles. Uh, one is 78, a retired former Parks Department employee, and the other is 21, a student at Stanford. So, it, again, like the the lesson here is if someone if a name comes out, um, it's really important to make sure that if you're going to start talking about that name, that you're identifying the right person. Um, there's two Arthur Fonzarellis in the area. If you're if you're searching for kind of information in order to use it. Um, then I think the 21-year-old who's a student at Stanford in the m and this is the mall right next to the university is probably the route to go down. You have no luck uh, reaching out to Stanford, but you do come across a linked, uh, a linked Instagram photo that indicates that he works part-time at a motorcycle repair store in Redwood City. Um, this is him in the uh, repair store. Um, it's difficult to use this photo on Instagram if you're, if you're a broadcaster because um, he didn't take it. Uh, Arthur Fonzarelli is the one on the left, by the way. Um, he didn't take it because it's not a selfie. Someone else has permission. Someone else owns the rights to that photo, um, and that's something to consider uh, when you're verifying it. This is Redwood City uh, Motorcycle Repair, and you can see that it's pretty close to the... the I don't know if my mouse will show up. No, it's, it's pretty close to, to where the university is and that mall. His, in, his username on Instagram is uh, Fonzie74. Now, using a common... Uh, people... Who, who in the room has a, the same username across a couple of social profiles? Exactly. So if you find someone who you think is pretty likely to be uh, a person of interest in the story... If you search for their username um, in, 
in other places, you're you're likely to get uh, the same person with but just different social accounts. So Fonzie74 on Google reveals a YouTube account with the same username. The videos are mostly from the annual Sunnyvale Motorcycle Show from June 2013, showing bikes in an awards ceremony. There was one very recent video posted four hours ago. The most recent video shows a rolling text on the screen. The important part reads, sorry for what I'm about to do. It's all because my best bud left for the military. So you're now pretty sure because you've done that background checking and that verification that the Fonzarelli is your shooter and you need images. Um, so this you have so much information to go on now, and I'm just going to go back to to this. So and this this was this was a, a scenario. This is a fictional scenario, but it's based on kind of real life uh, events that have happened. I don't know if you remember the Gabrielle Giffords shooting in. Um, in Arizona, but um, the first images that were actually uh, came out of the, of the of the shooter Jared Lofner were because there were links on his uh, video uh, to uh, he was talking a lot about literature and books, and actually by cross referencing that we were able to connect his name to a book fair, and there was a photo of him at a book fair, um, and that was the first photo. Um, used to, to show his face in that situation. Now, again, all of this can be quite time consuming, but if you're verifying it properly and you're not making any leaps, you're going to be at the point where you can uh, confidently publish something before your competitors who might not be doing this. Um, and that's why it's important to be really vigilant with the verification, uh, because you don't want to be wrong if you're going to be a little bit later coming to the story, but with something fresh and new. And then just to, um, the, the final development in this is that suddenly Richie Cunningham wakes up um, shouting for Mr. and Mrs. Cunningham. It's just all been a, a horrible dream. So um, that's, the, that's, that's the scenario. I, that's, it is based on, on potentially a collection of, of things that have happened to me when I've been verifying stories. This, that, that stuff does happen. Um, and you can, if, you, if your processes are right for the newsroom, then you will get, get more out of it and you'll do it in a sensitive way as well. So this, yes. <coughs> Quick question, the, um, uh, the video or the, the photo um, that you mentioned before, yep. um, I think in your, in your scenario, your, the presumption was that, that that was a true photo or a true video. Yep. And, and uh, if you had verified uh, or, or had proven that it was false, would you then, um, because it's making the rounds on social media, say, hey, we uh, we verified this is false, this is not the actual thing, in, in the way that if it was accurate, you would, would hold back from it, but if it's false, you could uh, identify it and say, hey, this is not a real thing. I, I think there's, um, I think that every news organization has to kind of work out where they where they stand on, on uh, debunking stuff. It can be really, if you debunk something and put an, if you, if you've been using your searches to find fake and, and fake content has come out, actually sometimes your searches are more advanced than everyone else's and they may not have seen that photo. And sometimes by actually putting it out there and debunking it, it will end up with all of the debunking information stripped off it and, and help circulate it anyway. That can be one argument. Another argument can be, can be putting it out there for debunking. Some people debunk really well. Um, some people prefer not to for that, for that reason. I don't know where I stand on it. I think it's a it's a personal uh, a personal preference for your newsroom. Also, if you have access, if you can quick, if you have a place to be able to do that, it can be useful, and al and also it can it can help uh, form part of the story later on after the live situation is over. So, I prefer to report what is genuine. That's my my uh, stance rather than talk about what's what's fake. Also. There's a, it, my personal opinion on, f on fakes and debunking is you can, you, you actually can be spending a lot of time working out how fake something is, whereas I would rather spend that time working out how genuine something might be. Um, you only, if something doesn't seem right, you move on to find something that you, that you can tell the right story with, um, rather than working out actually this is fake because of this and this and this and this. I just need to know it's fake because of this and then I'll move on. So, um, tools. Search and monitoring is, 
is the are the kind of most important tools and setup that uh, that you need when it comes to to doing all of this. Um, and like I said, setting up your kind of standards in advance, setting up your tools in advance are important. So learning how to use uh, Twitter, the native searches lists. Um, that is important for, monitor, for being able to monitor breaking news. Also, uh, monitoring people who might be debunking. Um, because debunking does happen a lot on social, whether you choose to publish that yourself um, through a kind of an official outlet is, is a different matter. But people are having a conversation around that. So a lot of these tools are not necessarily advanced, but it's about learning how to use them properly. And I actually think learning how to use them really well especially as a lot of tools rely on close collaboration with the big social networks and platforms. And if they make any changes, sometimes the tools then become uh, defunct. So learning the, the networks inside out is incredibly important. So for, for Twitter, learning how to use native search and, and uh, Boolean searches uh, and uh, geo searches is, is, is vastly important and, and, and incredibly valuable. Um, the same as YouTube, know the way that people share, know, uh, start creating lists and monitoring lists uh, for that. That way, um, if, you, if you're covering a certain beat or a certain patch, then you're able to, um, to bring up uh, people who may be there straight away, um, accounts that will help lead you to other things. Also learn how to use the messaging. So you can't ask someone for, for contact if you don't know how to use uh, the messaging function on YouTube in order to message them for permission or to ask them more about it. Uh, Facebook, um, the only way that you can effectively search Facebook is by using Facebook's own graph search. Um, they have turned off uh, the functionality for third parties to be able to search uh, using Facebook. So. Knowing how to use that and knowing how the algorithms work, again, will help you understand if you're getting skewed information. It will help you if you're getting accurate information. Um, I find that when you're searching for Facebook, it's actually useful to, to uh, get there by other means. So you might find people linking to Facebook videos on Twitter. And the way that you, uh, the way that you do that is, and, and also kind of, uh, find those connected accounts is if you get a Facebook URL or a YouTube URL for a video, put that into Twitter and see who shared it first. Uh, that's a really good way to find connected accounts and potentially connected content, but also the original sources. And then Instagram. Instagram, you can't actually, as far as I'm aware, search in the comments, um, but you can search for what people write when they attach. Some, however, the, co the information in comments is incredibly valuable. And I would urge you to, to um, always try and go to Instagram, however you got there, but look at the original pages to see the additional information that is being shared within the comments. A lot of tools are spitting out um, you know, Instagram and, and Facebook content or uh, uh, Twitter content and just showing you the actual image. If you go back to the network itself, you're going to see a lot of extra information. I saw an example of someone asking for permission to someone sharing a tornado video the other day. Um, that video, they said, they didn't, cl they clearly didn't look at the comments. They said, can we use permission to use the video? She said, yes, you can use permission, but uh, yes, you have permission, but it's not mine. I took it from TV, I took a screenshot of the TV. Now, it was an automated process. And so that channel ran the video, I think, or ran the photo because they didn't actually look at the ex extra context. We are journalists. Every other time that we do any kind of reporting, we look at that extra information. It's so important to do it when we're talking about social content as well. So um, I feel embarrassed that we've got someone from Google in the room using a, a probably old logos. but. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, some Google tools. Um, reverse image search on Google is uh, really useful. Um, and I've actually used it to, the, there was one state news agency that put out some con a, a video of, a, of a, a photo of a purported explosion at a power plant, um, attached it to a story, put it into reverse image search, and the, the uh, image was from a couple of years ago in a completely different country. 
Um, so you can use those searches to not just check social content, but any any content that that you uh, that you have a feeling might not be genuine. Um, people don't also n realize that with Google Image Search, you can uh, you can drag a photo that you've got into the box, and it searches that. You can also search with it with a URL to a, a, a linked photo. It also shows you um, not just if that video, if that photo has existed before, but if you are trying to find a location and you've got a, a photo that clearly shows a building, it's sometimes worth putting it into a Google image search because if you're trying to work out where that is, it will show similar photos showing the same, showing the same monuments and that can help you work out exactly where you're, where you're seeing it. Um, so Google Translate is uh, very useful as well. I use it a lot, but it's not always accurate. So if you have a put someone that can do it, do a translation for you, um, then then ask them because it's better. It, Google Translate is also not so good when it comes to place names because place names uh, can't always be directly translated or have different uh, names in different languages. Um, the only thing I use Wikipedia for when it comes to verification is actually for place names. So if you put in the uh, a place name that you're searching for into Wikipedia, the very the it will come up with the, the place that you search for, and then in brackets next to it, it will come up with the uh, place name in the native language. And if you copy and paste that, that is the usually the actual place name rather than a direct translation. And that will really help you when you're searching. Because don't forget, when you're searching for content that, you need, that you're verifying, people who are in, in their own countries speak in their own languages and use their own slang. Therefore, you need to be searching using that, that, those words as well. Um, Google Maps and uh, location information is useful. Uh, s using satellite views to look at terrain is also uh, useful. Um, I've been working on video from, from Syria where I've been able to pinpoint the exact location that someone's been stood on a rooftop filming. They were streaming that live and that helped me not use it because I knew that if I could pinpoint where, what rooftop they were on, um, it means that people who are aiming guns at them could as well. Um, uh, Google Chrome is is my preferred browser because of all the uh, plugins that you can use. So you can use screen capture plugins. Um, you can use the company that I work for has has a plugin that allows you to just um, drag stuff into it directly from TweetDeck. Um, cr have a look through the through the various uh, Chrome extensions in the store, and then you'll see things that are pretty useful. The idea being is that you can capture this stuff really quickly without having to leave your leave your browser. And then Google Plus. Um, you may not think that, that uh, many people would talk about it, but actually I use it a lot for verifying information. It's very, very useful for monitoring uh, sources because uh, when it was set up, a lot of news organizations automated their feeds to Google Plus. So you, you can get a lot of kind of local updates and news if you go to their Google Plus page and set up lists, and it's a stream of media-rich uh, images and, and uh, stories. That can be, not many people are looking at that, and it can be really useful for working out where an event is happening. Also, things like uh, open newsrooms and uh, Google Hangouts uh, can help you get in touch with people really quickly. Um, and then YouTube, I, I've already spoken about. So one, one really useful tool that, that I use is, is the YouTube Data Viewer by Amnesty. So we can't, you, there's no such thing as a reverse image lookup for video, but this is the closest uh, that we can get for video. So if you put the URL in there, it will tell you the exact date and time that it was uploaded. Now, Google, if you're looking on the YouTube search results, you'll see this was uploaded an hour ago or two days ago, and you, some, you can't always necessarily get to the, to the actual time and date. So if you're trying to work out original sources and you've got two that were uploaded in a very short space of time, if you put the URL into the, the uh, data viewer, it will show you the exact uh, minute and second that it was uploaded, and then you'll be able to see which one was uploaded first. It also helps you, it also um, takes thumbnails from the video so that you can put it into a reverse image search. That's not so useful because it requires someone to have captured the exact same thumbnail, but it, it, it might be useful now and again. 
So um, I work for, a, uh, I left the AP to work for a company that deals with verification workflows, and, and so I, I have to at least show you two slides to talk about that. So I, I mentioned that workflows was, was the key to, to understanding, um, to getting verification right, and I, I believe it so much that I've invested a lot in it, in, in, of my time in that. So SAM is a, is a tool that allows you to search for content and uh, curate content within your teams so that you're not cutting, you're not sending constant emails with, uh, between your team, you're not forgetting to include that important manager and then getting told off. Everyone can see everything at the same time as you find it and you're not doubling up on efforts to communicate with the same people. Also, you can publish that content really quickly and I've got a screenshot just to show you um, how my tool works. So uh, you can see these are assets that have been brought in from Twitter on a, on a breaking story on the right and Sam allows you to tag it um, with, with your own tags, so verified tags or breaking tags or needs translation and then you can uh, write, your team can write your own notes so this needs, this needs um, permission or this needs um, uh, you to, to translate it Everyone can then collaborate on a story and you can invite all of your team members in to do that. Um, you can also, at the top right-hand corner, you see import asset from URL. So I, the thing I used to hate was people sending me the same video over and over again um, via email. Um, so if you just get the URL and plonk it in there, you can, you can pull in the content straight away. Everyone on your team can then see it and you're gonna not get those emails again. Got uh, just a couple more, and that's a, a close-up of that. So I've got, I'm going to very, very quickly talk about some of the kind of ethical things that we've talked about because I do work with ONA on the ethics of UGC. So this is a, a slide that I've put together to kind of hammer down the, the ethical issues. What right do we have to this content? Are there ever exceptional circumstances where we don't necessarily have to get permission or can we can run this content? Um, how protective of we are we of our own content? As journalists, if someone was to use the, our content under a fair deal or because it was interesting or because it served their purposes, would we go after them uh, pretty hard and are we doing the same thing to them? Should we credit them? How should we credit them? And then um, how do we keep this content relevant to the audience and, and our ethics? I'm of the opinion that, every, that people are starting to use second screens. If you credit someone on screen, they will go back and look at that video on the original page. Or they will have come across this stuff during the day and probably been following it from the original sources. We have to find the original sources so that we can, um, we can show them that we know what we're doing. Also, there's a legal versus ethical argument. Just because you can get away with something doesn't mean that we should. We don't want to turn off our audiences. And uh, uh, transparency is, is key when it, our audiences know this. I, I want to get rid of this from ever appearing on broadcasters or publishers. This video could not be independently verified. After me talking to you for 54 minutes, I don't think that this statement is true. Ownership. So, uh, again, people are owning, people are in the right place at the right time capturing incredible content that we can't get just because we're not there. It's not our fault that we weren't there, but they were there and they have something that's valuable. I think that we have to respect that in order to not turn audiences off. Permissions, I talked about, uh, um, we're gonna see a big trend towards automated permissions. I'm a bit nervous about that because I think it, it doesn't potentially go through this verification process because of the original source aspect. But permissions is, is an incredibly important uh, ethical issue. And um, I'll just flag it, with I'm doing a session tomorrow afternoon where we're going to focus entirely on how you can be ethical and competitive when it comes to UGC. And then finally, um, before I, we can take a few questions, I've got uh, a, a, com a, a kind of illustration of, of adding value. So this is actually something that, that I found, uh, I did when I was at the AP. Uh, a, a tornado hit Moore, Oklahoma. Um, and this, and there were lots of videos that uh, emerged um, at the time, showing showing destruction and and you know the incredible tornado video. This appeared a few days later and was and surfaced a few days later, and it was really quite quite old in 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 this in the kind of context of the story. But instead of just running it, what we actually did was uh, at the AP we got the crew on the ground to go and speak to the individuals and 
who had filmed it. We, we tracked down the original source um, and we spoke to them. And so from a vertical video, which is horrible, um, we, we got this story. Horrible vertical video. expecting it to come our way, but eventually we saw the debris cloud, and uh, we knew we had to get in the shelter. We ran straight here, piled everybody in. I, I was one of the people that were closest to the door, and uh, I managed to get a pretty good angle through this hole right here. So by finding the original source, this is how you're able to give context to a vertical video. Otherwise, it would have shot. just existed so as a horrible vertical video on YouTube forevermore. Because I've never been in a tornado before, so uh, this side of the street is like pretty decent, and then you look one street over, and it's just demolished. and it freshens up a two-day-old video into something that's that's verified and and uh, adding the context that only journalists can. So I think we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you, grazie. E naturalmente adesso siamo, I mean, costretti, uh, we are forced to, uh, leave, uh, to make room for the next session. Ma, uh, we are, of course, uh